Welcome to the Startup Grind. Have you all here tonight? Uh, my name is Terry Billington and I am a business coach and I'm also the global lead facilitator for a program that we're running in this room over this current two weeks called iLab. Uh, you may see some things stuck on the windows and our whiteboard over there, so an example of what these guys are going through. There's a few of them in the room at the moment, so they're probably glad to have a rest in the beanbag <laughs> instead of our busy schedule that we've had. Uh, just to give you a bit of insight, if you don't know about Startup Grind, Startup Grind is a, a global community for entrepreneurs and it's run in 300 cities in 115 countries around the world with over a million entrepreneurs that are part of it. So we're, we're really blessed to be able to do this and I have the absolute honour of interviewing this man who happens to be a good friend of mine as well as an amazing entrepreneur and his name is Mark Pinto and he's in his business or his branding that he has which is primitive has got many businesses attached to it now so he's going to share his story about that and you will see he's got his own brand which is pretty damn awesome uh, without any further ado let's give him a round of applause and bring him up thanks Mark so Mark tell us a bit about your story as in you were born in Singapore I was born in Singapore. Yeah, and go on from there more. Okay, so I was born in Singapore and uh, I served my national service as a policeman till the age of 20. And then I had the opportunity to leave Singapore for Australia because my family was there. And uh, so I took, uh, I took it on and I went there literally with two suitcases because that's all I had because uh, being in the police force, you get peanuts those days. Um, but it was something I learned a lot. Uh, and so when I went there, at the time in Perth was a very small, quiet town. Uh, there was nothing much after six o'clock. There's still nothing much after six o'clock. But uh, I, I couldn't get a job. And unemployment was really high. Uh, and I had the... Uh, I was actually a school dropout, by the way. So I left school... Uh, on secondary two uh, and subsequently my parents were really upset with me so I thought I needed to do something I didn't work I hustled my way up all the way to making my own funds when I was jobless uh, and I managed to convince my father to put me through gemological school because a friend had offered me a very good table in um, in a high-rise part in Orchard Road, Shaw Towers, it was. Uh, and he said to me, he said, you've hustled all my money out of me, but if you could get this qualification, I would give you this table. So I said, okay, you got a deal. I've just got to convince my father. So I managed to convince my father to send me to school in between as well, before national service, and I got that qualification. So I'm, I'm an accredited gemologist. Uh, my first profession was grading diamonds, rubies, and sapphires, which when I succeeded and I went back, he went bankrupt, so I didn't get that job. <laughs> so, so then going, going forward, I moved to Australia and I was jobless, but I had that accreditation. At that time, the best mine was Argyle, the diamond mine. So I thought, hey, what the hell, I've got the qualifications I can get in. Uh, they didn't recognize that qualifications. And I could not uh, get a... Um, equivalency test because I did not finish my year 12. So they told me, go back to school uh, or you can't go to the uh, GIA, uh, Gemological Institute of America, to get the equivalency t test. So that didn't materialize and I was trying to get jobs which I couldn't for six months. Uh, I was literally on the door for a few months because I was 20 at that time and I wanted to get a job and I started applying for all these jobs and I actually got a job, funny enough, in a sex shop. <laughs> so uh, I took up the job and I said, all right, you know, th these guys are going to give me some casual work. And I said, if I could prove sales to you in six months and increase your turnover, would you give me a full-time job because I need a full-time job? Uh, he said yes and in six months I increased the sales but he didn't keep to his word so I decided I got to do something else for myself, and that's when I 
decided to take a loan out from my parents and uh, start my own piercing shop for two years, which was really successful because I found a gap in the market and we took the trend. Um, I had to learn by myself, totally self-taught with nothing but that loan. Uh, so I had to make it happen. From that, we built that business so much so that we could actually open another one to move to the city. So I found this location. It was in the worst part of town at the time, which was Barrack Street, which I'm still at for, you know, 21 years down the road. I'm still on that street. That street turned out to be one of the best streets now because of the traffic and all that. But um, I moved my shop down because we wanted to venture into tattooing. And I got in the hard way into getting myself through uh, networking with a lot of the artists to let me in on a deal in the heart of town because that was ultimately going to be the best location. I, I foresee that, foreseen that. So being at the start of the worst part of town and just building the business, I had about six employees in the first year and a half. Uh, then I moved on to tattooing and I had another, I think four or five more. And suddenly tattooing took over and then we neglected piercing. So we dropped the six staff of the piercing and we had at one stage up to 16 staff for tattooing and, and around it. And that business really grew to what I diversified to today, which is body jewelry, tribal art, uh, restaurant and property and all that through hard work and reinvestments. So, um, you know, over the years, that's what I did. So, in particular, so you went from being in the police force to a sex worker. <laughs> to <a> sex worker. <laughs> <laughs> a, a, oh, you did sex, sex work. <laughs> you sold sex into uh, sex piercing <laughs> and yeah. then onto tattoos. With your tattooing, uh, you're very unique in the style that you, you do that, which because it's very competitive, right? It's very competitive in Perth. It's competitive everywhere. So ta share a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, when, when um, I went into tattooing, um, with, with every job that uh, I took upon to start, a business rather, uh, I needed to be different. I needed to, to fill a gap, uh, you know, for what's not already there and to create something that people could see of value. Um, I didn't really understand what that meant when I first started, but as I went along and got the experience, I was good at creating something that wasn't there or building, building the hype for something and, and being the expert in, in that particular field. So we started with uh, doing tribal tattoos in a time where tribal was uh, getting very popular, but we tweaked it so that we made it very authentic and different. And then people started copying, which is very complimenting. And then it grew to that trend. And when that trend died, we needed to find another trend. So we were always ahead of trends uh, and, and we were in the best location as well. So as we went along, that's what I became good at, st starting trends and filling up gaps. Um, and, and that's what made us different. So we did Japanese tattooing, I did that, and I think my specialty till today still is the hand tattooing, which a lot of people try to get into, but they can't because it's passed down, and it's through building rapports and uh, you know, friendships, long-term friendships, before they give you something of great value to them, which is cultural, uh, that you can't pay for. So that's my specialty. So where or how did you, where and how did you actually get trained as a tattoo artist? Self-taught, on the garden, a long time ago. On the garden? On, on, on a mat in the garden, yeah. Uh, I, I got into tattooing the hard way in Perth because there was no one there to guide me. But while I was, uh, when, when I was in Singapore pre-service, when I was out of school and all that, I was hanging around a tattoo shop we made close friends, I got a lot of tattoos, I didn't want to do any tattooing then. But I helped out the shop and through the value of giving uh, five years of my time helping them, they gave me back uh, a lot of things, uh, a lot of lessons that I learned as well as the skill of tattooing without physically doing it. So I knew everything about it. I just didn't do it, I didn't, didn't practice it. So when I went to Australia, I had to start practicing it, which was very hard being by myself. However, I knew theoretically everything I just didn't have the experience practically. So that's what I needed to gain. So I was really bad when I first started. Yeah, like everyone. Yeah. Okay, so you continued with the tattoo business. Mm -hmm. 
I remember Ma, when we first met, which was maybe five, six years ago or when, whenever that was, and we met in a, a room with Roger Hamilton mm -hmm. uh, and there was four or five of us. And I remember Roger giving you some advice in that room about you uh, getting away from the tattooing as much as what you were and doing something else. So tell us what that was. So, so yes, I met Terry at Fast Forward in Perth and Roger did this uh, personal mentorship for I think it was 15 minutes each at a time. And we had to pay something like $300 or something just so that you could show us the flight path. And I went in there and that's when I met Terry and uh, he was mapping each of our four businesses and showing where we are now and where we could be. Uh, and he said, uh, you need to be different, right? You need to be different and you can't exchange, because I went there because I was time poor. I, I was getting good money, but I just didn't, I, I hit a brick wall, I couldn't climb over that wall to earn more, but I didn't have any more time. So I needed to scale back and get my time back, but I also needed to increase my, my revenue as well, personal, personally. Um, so he, he mentioned in brief, uh, you know, some value points of how I could do that. And uh, that's when I joined the Crystal Circle. But he rejected me at first, right? Were that's Roger's mentoring group, by Yeah, the way. Roger's mentoring group was the Crystal Circle, uh, personal mentoring. And uh, he actually rejected me. And I said, no, I see great value in this. I need to be part of this. And I want to be part of this. So I got in. And uh, as a result uh, of the mentorship, I scaled my business so much so to make... Uh, I've got, I've got a lot of staff that I knew how to then get them into uh, their own specialty to be totally different than a lot of other artists around the city because it was very competitive and a lot of people were making very good money at the time because uh, that, was, that was just pre the uh, mining boom. And uh, when the mining boom happened, people were throwing money around Perth. So they, you know everyone was getting tattoos and... Uh, so we, we got ahead because I had that skill to give them their, their vision on specialty, make them different and guide them through the process of how they could then leverage and be the expert in their particular field because I couldn't do everything, nor was I great at everything. So I just focused on the stuff that I was good at I, and, and the stuff that I wasn't good at, I had people to fill in and I made them good by just mentoring them. Um, and so much so that we were the go-to shop for quite a while and we were booked up massively, but more importantly, we were getting, uh, I don't know, we were getting great prices for our tattoos and we still do today because of our reputation, but uh, it just didn't stop from there. So what was your retention rate for your staff that worked with you? How long were they staying? Before I, I used the, uh, the personal mentoring uh, and, and giving them value so that they could stay longer. People were just getting the knowledge and moving on. And they were taking a lot of the uh, very fine uh, information that I had coached them on and they were going to all the other shops. So when I look around in Perth now, I think I have, out of the, the nine top 10 shops, I would have at least one or two people in each that I've trained. Um, that's not a problem because you know that's a, a kind of a compliment as well to me that they've taken something and they've made something out of themselves. Um, but they only had so much knowledge and as I went on, I cultured the people that stayed with me so much so that they had so much value that they didn't want to leave anymore. So my current retention rate for staff is, or team members I should say, is uh, between five and 10 years. So they, they are staying a lot longer. Most of them are past five years already. That's a really good insight for everyone too, is that when you have great people working with you and they leave to go and do it themselves, uh, there's two sides of it. One is that they obviously, like you said, only have a level of skill. Mm -hmm. And the other side is that it's a real compliment. It yeah. is a compliment. So from that perspective, those that stayed, do you feel they stayed because they felt they could grow more within you? Within, with being part of your business or what was the reason that you yeah, think Yeah, I think I made the business so easy for them to be a business within a business, uh, so much so that they just need to front up for work and they'd have all their appointments booked from my front of house uh, and all they really needed to do was follow their passion and draw their designs 
and facilitate the, uh, the client with uh, service so that they come back and, and just, you know, um, I guess give them a lot of comfort during the process, good bedside manner, hand holding session, uh, and just taking them through the whole process and giving them a lifetime memory. So with, with all the small points, uh, they made a, a better name for themselves. And if they, they didn't want to leave because they knew how much work it is uh, in running the back end and the front end of the business, and that I had my teams in place for both ends, and all they had to do was just show up, right? So um, in saying that, they all don't feel the need to want to leave because when they've seen the rest of the people leave, they went from something to a dream and got nothing out of it. And a lot of them came back, in which case I opened the doors for them again because they, they now knew. And, but that was almost like a, an assurance to the rest of the guys that if you leave, good luck to you. But uh, you know, if you don't make it, come back. You know, you've got to try everything once, right? Um, the, the most, uh, I think, privileged thing that I feel is I get a lot of guest artists from around the world that have heard about us uh, through other friends. Uh, and, and all over, I mean, France, Britain, Germany, everywhere. Uh, and they come in and they can only work in my studio for six months. But in that time of six months, and some of them have great skills, some of them have little skill, and I give them opportunities. They end up leaving, uh, wanting to come back, but they can't because of the visa requirements. But they end up opening shop elsewhere. So I've got team members that have open shop in Japan, Amsterdam, in uh, Italy. So it's it's quite a yeah, it's quite a, a good accomplishment for me as well. The feeling rather, rather you know to see them succeed. Yeah. yeah, it is a compliment to you, Mark. So when you first started your uh, tattoo studio, was it primitive? Were you called mm -hmm. primitive then? Yeah, so where, uh, once your tattoo business was at a certain level, when was the decision made to move into the next part of your primitive brand? Um, I, I was always one to multitask and do a lot of stuff, so I, I was always doing something as a sideline to my tattooing because I just couldn't sit still. Um, the tribal art came in 1997 when I actually went to Borneo with my then wife-to-be. Um, actually, no, she, we were just married. We went for a honeymoon, and we went into the longhouse of uh, Skrang River in Malaysian Borneo, Sarawak. And right there, through friends, uh, I wanted to get a traditional tattoo and have the feeling of it. Uh, they, they managed to arrange everything for me and as I went there I started to buy stuff because they were trying to sell us stuff to get some extra money, tourist stuff. And, and I bought some and I went now and then I bought some more and I've helped because I, you know, I like to you know, give back. So I, I helped these people but it sparked an interest of collecting as well. So every year thereafter I went back there to learn more about the, the tribal aspect of tattooing, the carvings and or to learn my skill of uh, collecting artifacts. Built a great rapport with a dealer back then. Uh, we built a very great friendship till today, more than 20 years. Uh, and he has uh, taught me everything I need to know about uh, collecting art and how to look and tell the age, uh, whether it's false or fabricated, uh, and, and, and much more, much more than that. So. My collecting grew from that, from the, 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 um, the tattooing. And uh, so we, we hold a very large collection of uh, Indonesian art. Uh, I used to sell as well, but I've also now changed from a dealer to a collector. So I, in fact, I collect a lot more pieces now than I did when I was dealing. Uh, and I collect a lot of high-end pieces. So I do sell uh, to you know, museums and stuff like that as well, and big collectors. So that was one avenue from my tattooing, and the other one was the jewelry side of things, where we uh, assist uh, the people here with the localized handmade beads, but that's one of our uh, levels of the jewelry, and the other one is uh, what I wanted to do for a long time and finally had a chance to do, which was get back into my diamonds. So we started a range of uh, white gold and diamonds uh, jewelry uh, bracelets as well, so that those two came out of that. 
but um, along the way, I was always reinvesting in art and all that and property. So my, my parents told me from a young age, get into property, but I never listened. So I had my first property at 18 and I stopped for about 10 or 15 years and then I started to look into another one and another one. And through, through the investments, I started to build the equity to buy more. And then I went into uh, real estate coaching, not coaching, learning. So I, 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 I love mentorship, getting mentored. So I pay for a lot of different courses for whatever I want to get into, any other businesses, for example. And property was one that really intrigued me, but it, it was how to manufacture property, so to speak, buying one piece and how do you turn it into four, uh, you know, or three or eight, you know. And uh, so I spent a whole year flying around Australia, just going to all these courses at my own time and expense to learn the skill within a year. That was my goal. And the next year, I was to implement that deal, uh, you know, all the, all the learnings. So, so that's what I did. Yeah. So how was your tattoo studio being looked after when you were doing all these different things? Because that's the thing, like you're, you've got a creative mind. You're a yeah. creator in the profiling sense. Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of ideas coming up in your head. You've always got something different. How, do you, how did you maintain the, the business growth with the tattoo studio while you were doing the, the art and mm. the um, jewellery? I had a lot of trouble at first relieving myself from the shop because I had my team uh, there and they felt that if I wasn't there, uh, that I didn't care. So there was a lot of work in changing the mindset of my team members. So how, how I did that uh, was to tell them as well that you, know, you, you, you don't have to be here, you're only here for the customer, literally. And if you want to be here for the team, you can. But uh, you know, because I was in and out and traveling all, all the time, they didn't un they really understand what I was doing when I was traveling. Whether I was researching, I was buying, I was selling, I was uh, doing my due diligence on properties and all that. I wasn't very forthcoming because that was my thing, you know? Um, and they thought I was um, kind of neglecting them. So it, it was about building a team culture thereafter to try and explain to them that this is what I do with my free time. I don't really like to sit around and do nothing. I chase my own vision and my dreams, right? Uh, and finding the right team uh, to facilitate the whole uh, team member, to facilitate the whole team, a good manager. So they were there when everything was needed so I could exclude myself whenever I need to, needed to in, in, a, in a moment's notice. So. I'm only there for my clients now, and my team members, uh, we, we, get, we get together every now and again so that we can bond, um, but they know that I travel in a minute's notice, so. How important is it that your team members, or how much do you instill in your team members that they have their own vision with what they want to achieve? Yeah. With the experience I got, I also tell them, you know, I also try and uh, you give them the opportunity to uh, excel themselves, so tattooing is not the be all and end all, that's their means of, uh, you know, earning a living. But I said, you know, to them, if you want any information on how you can diversify into property or whatsoever, free advice is just a question away, you know, just ask me and I'll show you. So a lot of them, like, uh, you know, I've got a staff that does eyebrow tattooing now, and she goes, I want to do this business. I said, okay, you know, why don't you do it here? Why do you want to go out and pay rent, you know? And, and so we give them the opportunities as well. Some sell t-shirts in my shop. You know, it's just being open because it's not, that's not a, a big deal in it for me, but it's something else for them. So, uh, you know, it's about give and take, I think. So that's a great retention strategy, I think, is I let is them too, yeah. be part of the it growth. Is. Their business stay, remains as part of yours. And they have trust, right? They have yeah, trust. It, it's, all about the tr it's all about the trust as well. You know, it's uh, giving them the, the, the foot. Uh, you know, I mean, if they, if they were to go and open their business el elsewhere and they didn't have that skill, it would be painful if they failed. Uh, but failure is a good learning lesson as well. But a lot of them, they're not very business-like because we, we have already fed them with all the jobs so they don't have that fundamental skills. So I, I can coach them on that, but a lot of them don't want to take the leap because th there's a risk involved. The risk factor is not what uh, they want to take if they're a worker mentality, so to speak, you know? So, um, yeah, 
they, they work within our place because they don't have to pay the, the high overheads that Perth offers. Smart move. <laughs> uh, we'll go a little bit more into your property in a moment, but first of all, I want to talk about uh, what you've done, like over the, your restaurant that you open up. How long's that deja vu been open now? Uh, it's been about a year now. Yeah, so I, re I remember that exact moment when you started mm. talking about that. And it was, you know, communicating with the right people and the excitement. And Mark's someone that if he has an idea in his head and he believes he can do it, he just goes with the idea and the rest follows. So tell, tell everyone a little bit more about Deja Vu and how that came about. I think Deja Vu came about... Uh, I was tattooing one day uh, mid-2016 and... Uh, I decided to bring some of my staff across the street to the bar and while we were at the bar I was just talking to the guy that owned the bar and I said, oh, well, it's a nice business, the bar. I said, you know, how does one get into it? And he just kept on talking casually over a drink and he says, but I got this place up the road. Uh, it's a rooftop venue that I can't really uh, move into uh, and uh, I'm looking for a partner. I said, wow, I need to see this place. So I said, can we go there tomorrow? Because I was excited already. Uh, and, and we went there the next day, and uh, I looked at this place and go, oh my God, this guy doesn't know he's sitting on a jam. Um, and uh, so I said, okay, I'll do you a deal. I said, I'll fund this business and I'll give you the, uh, um, the intellectual property. I'll set up, I'll build a brand for you, uh, but you run it. I'll just fund the money and, and give you that as an incentive. Uh, and we got on talking for a few days and then he said, yeah, okay, let's do it. Because he had to say yes because he couldn't supplement the rent anyway. He needed someone there. Uh, and then I thought, okay, he's agreed. Now how do I do it, right? So I didn't know anything about the restaurant business. So I came in and I was messaging a few people in the network. Uh, and I said, who can I speak to? And they pointed me to Chef Cynthia and Kitia. And uh, I was on a call one day. I can't remember if I, I was here for iLab maybe. I was on a call for uh, 15 minutes with Kitty on the phone. I said, I've got this thing, I've got this venue and all that, and I know you're the go-to person. Would you like to partner? And, and this is my idea, my concept. And it totally um, went uh, you know, in line with what she believes in. And she said yes, right, right there and then 15 minute call. So I said, okay, we've got a deal. Um, so then I started to work on the whole project and uh, I came back for Wealth Dynamics Masters to plan the whole restaurant business in, uh, in the case of that few days uh, and started it straight away. So it's, it's been about a year now and we're going to the final stage of my goal phase which is turning the restaurant rooftop to a bar, a small bar. Yeah. Uh, it's an amazing restaurant, that's a credit to you. But you, you set it up uniquely, I mean obviously we've got the concept of Genius Cafe and Kitia and Chef Cynthia who have been, in particular Chef Cynthia who's been paramount to that and Kitia with the, with the drinks and cocktails, but you took a, a different approach with it, which was a bit of a risk in Perth because, yeah. I mean, you know, when you're starting a business that you don't know anything about that industry, it's always safer to do it mainstream, yet yeah. you didn't, you went left field with it. Yeah. so. Yeah. Tell us about that. Uh, I just want to make sure I clarify this right. I'm, I'm partnering with Kitia, and I actually asked Chef Cynthia, but she declined to assist us because it didn't really, it wasn't the right time for her. But um, so I knew that there was a gap in the Perth market for vegan food, um, and I knew uh, that they didn't have much options for dinner because most of the vegan restaurants were served at breakfast or lunch. Uh, I just didn't know how to get it there. So with the dialogue I had with Kitia, and Kitia does uh, Genius Cafe, the, the food and the drinks as well. Um, so in partnering with her, we, we had a lot of uh, discussions on how we can approach this and, and how was to find the right avatars and, and uh, get the right people in place and all that. So. Uh, we, we saw the lag in having bush ingredients at the time in Perth because people ate all sorts of diversified food but they didn't know what bush ingredients were like the bush food, uh, fruits and seeds and nuts and all that. Uh, so we infused that with Asian food 
and deliver it in a tapas, uh, small plate way. Um, we then had to try to market it out to the vegans because it was something new. Um, but I thought, you know, we would try to work and make sure that the food spoke for itself so that uh, it would create a wildfire uh, with them coming in. And uh, we just invited a few bloggers and uh, for a start and a few close friends that were very, you know, very uh, prominent vegans and they had, a, you know, very strong following. And um, I think when we had our first tasting session before we opened the uh, restaurant, one of my vegan friends uh, that has an Instagram account um, just posted a couple of dishes and she just said, wow, you guys got to try this. And I think within that six hour period, we had 900 followers. So that was pretty awesome. Uh, and, um, you know, it just led on from there. I, I said to Mark when I went there, because the food is absolutely phenomenal and the cocktails and, you know, the way that you make those. But I said, I would turn vegan just to keep coming to this restaurant. But you don't need to be. That's the thing. It's so amazing, the, the variety of food that's there. And it's, I have never experienced that sort of food. So how important was it that you did have a partnership with someone that obviously knew that industry as opposed to doing it yourself? Yeah, it's very crucial. I, I was never in the restaurant business. I just had a dream that I wanted to be in one because it was fun and I love food. Uh, I didn't know how much fun it was at the time, but it's really tiring being in a restaurant business. Uh, but having a partner is really crucial because it gives us a sense of direction in any field. Uh, and, and partnering with the right people is also very crucial because it eliminates a, a few steps of error sometimes that can be costly as well. Um, so I knew what Kitty had done, and I knew that she could deliver on, on her side of the deal. And uh, on my side was just building the whole plan of the business and then finding the right person to cook, uh, the right chef to cook. So um, it was very, very uh, difficult to find the right people, but through the right questions that we asked, we could uh, enter a process of elimination to find out the right people for the actual position. You uh, have a restaurant in Perth, Western Australia, and how many Australians did you employ? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, at the moment, I think I have two out of 18. Yeah, I, I, I love diversification. Even my tattoo shop is based on international artists because we communicate a lot better, we have a lot of fun, we share a lot of culture as well. So I totally believe in internationals. Yeah, it was, it's a great way to see it and to be able to support people coming in. We're such a, a multicultural place everywhere. Look at Bali, how many different cultures are here. And I mean, you, you took basically what happens here into yeah. the restaurant there, which is, you know, is why um, people want to go there too, because it's different. It's not like you get the same that you'd get anywhere else. So where did the name Deja Vu come from? Yeah, I needed something to, for people to remember, almost like a, a deja vu moment. So, you know, we, we worked around the food and, and, the, and the culture around the brand because we wanted people to remember the taste uh, or the experience of first coming to their then vegan restaurant or whatsoever, you know. Uh, so we, we, uh, we got copy done to facilitate the, the, the brand and the, the name. Uh, we got the food to follow suit as well. We tweaked it in such a way that it explodes in your mouth. That was this really awesome taste. And people go like, what is this? You know, it, it tastes like meat, but it's not. You know, so we didn't really tell people it was a vegan restaurant. We never did for the first nine months. We just told them, come and eat this awesome food. It's feel good food. You, you love it. That's it. Do you think that's a good decision to make? You know, for those that are in business, is sometimes, you know, the expectations of people is that they will get told exactly what they're getting. Do you think it's sometimes good not to tell them exactly what they're going to get? I think people have a lot of faith and trust. If you have a team that can actually recommend and sell the products they believe in, then people don't question that as long as they're not trying to sell it. They're trying to share it. You know, 
uh, if it comes across really strongly that they're trying to sell a product, then it comes across as being really uh, unauthentic, you know? So uh, we obviously pride our staff as being the first in line, so they get taught uh, about the food and about you know, whatever we can teach them so that they can pass it on to the customers and experience. Awesome. So we'll open up for questions shortly, but first of all, I want you to share with everyone uh, what, you've, what you do here in, in Indonesia. You know, you come over here and it's, it's you know, beyond remarkable what you're doing. So if you can share a little bit about that. So um, my family is originally from Sumatra, part of my family. So I have Indonesian heritage, but uh, Indonesia is where a lot of my businesses lie, although I don't have a firm business here. So I buy my jewelry from here, for example. I buy my art from here. Um, I am building a property. We've got a couple of lots here as well, so we're building a property here for uh, short-term stays as well. Um, but most importantly, I give back to the people who have uh, taught me and showed me. So we have a community project that is a little bit behind, but it's, it's starting already. Uh, in Borneo, which is the heart of where I was taught about my art. So giving back to the community in terms of food, because that relates to my knowledge with deja vu and, and plant-based food. So we're giving back by planting a lot of uh, fruits and chocolate and stuff like that within the area of a seven hectare land that I acquired a while back for these people. So we intend to create food sources that is sustainable over there. Uh, and at the same time, because a lot of them rely on farming, and for example, if they're doing rice farming, that's a lot of work to harvest the rice and to replant it for next to nothing. You know, it takes months to do it. Whereas our concept would be to give them something that they could plant, take little care of, and have a bigger yield faster, so something that's sustainable, something that's not so perishable, uh, and, and, and stuff like that. So chocolate is not one of them. Chocolate is just a big dream that I have five years down the track where we can do organic chocolate, but that would be a supplementary business for people to get employment there. But on the side of the food stuff, we, we'll be doing things like, uh, we intend to do things like shiitake mushrooms because shiitake is very costly. It's also very good for them and it can just grow in the forest without us uh, deforest, uh, you know, chopping down trees and all that, so we can do erratic planting and all that. Um, ginger, uh, maybe ginseng, uh, vanilla, all, all these high-costing crops that you buy around the world for very expensive, uh, you know, costs, we can get it over there with little work, and, uh, and they can then harvest it and or plant it in their farms or sell it and make some better money than getting rice, for example. <clears throat> yeah, it's amazing what you're doing there. And, um, you know, it's, it, how important do you believe from an entrepreneurial uh, perspective is it that people do see that ability to give back? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I think it's important. Um, giving back is something that uh, I think uh, we should all do because it's, it's uh, you know, we should help the people that are a little bit less uh, fortunate, uh, be it in their location maybe, you know. Um, but uh, health is another thing as well that I, I like. So giving them the ability to have their health, you know, uh, right food or uh, even training them on what not to put in the soil or pesticides, what not to use, you know, uh, is, is helpful if we can encourage them to do it. Um, the other thing I, I overlooked mentioning was uh, we're in partnership with uh, Jason Kenneff and Tenny Kenneff, uh, who has their own foundation called the Project Child. So Project Child is a microfinancing uh, project that we are, I am involved in as well uh, in Yogyakarta that we can actually find people that we can support and mentor them into starting their own business by loaning them the money. Of course, they're responsible in paying back with little interest, but that's where they get the knowledge of responsibility as well. Um, but the mentoring and coaching is all included, where we actually would find the right candidates for it and uh, coach them to, you know, with, with our knowledge, coach them to how to get a business 
and then they can supplement their families and all that as well. So it's a pilot program that we're starting as well. Awesome. Some of these guys have had the, the iLab guys have had the honour of meeting Jason. He's been in and presented to them. So, uh, so just before I hand it over, one last question that I want to ask you. Um, diversification in your portfolio seems to be there. Uh, what do you think about diversifying? So you've got property, you've got business. What about things like cryptocurrency? How do you I mean, feel about that? Crypto as well, yeah. yeah. Um, crypto is great. It's down now. It's the best time to buy. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I love crypto. I know a lot of people don't understand a lot about crypto, but I'm, you know, I come from a forex background as well because I was taught in forex a while back as well in my early twenties. Uh, uh, so I've been a personal trader. Me and my family, we traded really heavily in in foreign exchange for a while. Um, so with that knowledge as well, I was looking into crypto, and since everyone, the biggest hype right now is in crypto, um, park some of my money there as well. Yeah, definitely. I, I'll just invest in anything that has potential for the future, and crypto is for the future. Awesome. Well, we might get some questions going out there. Uh, Slovak, can I get you to come and get the microphone, please? Uh, who has a question for Mark about anything that he's just discussed? Here? Thank you. Actually, I have two questions. Uh, one is, how did you have time to learn all of these skills? You have so many skills, uh, training people and uh, all of these different skills. So how did you learn all of that? And secondly, how do you see the vegan trend market looking for our future, okay. vegan, raw, and all of that? Okay, so I'll answer number two first. The vegan trend is the biggest trend that's going to happen. Uh, people don't know it yet, but everyone's leading to that way. If you look at social media, every second or third post is about eating healthy and vegans and all that, and cruelty to animals. Uh, I'm not a big vegan myself, but I enjoy vegan food, so it is a big trend. It's the next wave. Even uh, the big... Uh, People in big restaurants as well are leading towards that way and making vegan food very tasty now. When they have not used to be in the last three years, it was pretty bland and you ate for the sake of health and, and your, you know, your, your commitment to being vegan. But now it's getting really tasty, so everything's coming out because there's a big mass wave that's going to happen and people are understanding how they can actually diversify food to taste good as well and still keep the vegan concept or the vegan ethical, uh, you know, way. Uh, and, and how I learned so much over the time. My mother was a, a very strong person in personal growth, so she had all these books. When I was young, I didn't like to learn, but I was, you know, when I got to learning my gemology, uh, I then... From, from, from leaving school and not wanting to study because I didn't find a need for it, uh, I was merely a teenager growing up and a lot of people, uh, kids also don't like to study at that age. But when I, when I lacked in it, I needed to find something to fill that gap. I went to study and I found great pleasure in studying. Uh, so when I exceeded, I thought, wow, you know, this is one thing, but I need to get a lot of things under my belt. When, when I didn't have a job in Perth, it made me realize that I needed to fulfill myself with a lot of different knowledge skills so that I could take a lot of things on. I didn't know I was going to take a lot of them on because I didn't know how to, but I just followed my interests. I, uh, I, wasn't, a very, I wasn't great at studying, but I made it my passion to, to study, to get knowledge, and, and to get knowledge fast, but also to get a lot of mentors fast. So... Because I had a successful business, I could pay for a lot of stuff back then. And uh, rather than go to school to try and learn and spend two years of my life, I would find the best mentor in that particular field I wanted to excel. I would pay him the money to get personal hand-holding lessons or guidance, uh, and I would nail it within a year. And when that was done, I would refresh my memory time and again, but I would find the next step. So, I, I mean, I've been through forex, through piercing, through tattooing, through, all sorts, you know. So 
it was a fun thing for me to follow. I still do it till today. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I personally have two questions. Okay. First question about uh, Deja Vu. <clears throat> um, when you have the cash and you said that uh, you, you put in the cash and they will run it, um, how was the, I, I just want to know how do you actually split how much equity you have and what kind of profit sharing you have with them. So how do you actually establish that to balance off so that they kick start it? So th I think that's, that's the tipping point and how you actually do it and people follow you. Yeah. Yeah. So the equity sharing and also the profit sharing. And the, sec the, the second question is, um, what is your exit plan? I, 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 as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. so I, I, you know, I don't know, you know, you have any. So, thanks. I have never gone into something to exit. Um, mostly, I've gone into something to scale. So a lot of my projects, especially the restaurant, is actually my first restaurant. So it's actually a pilot project. That is a project plan to scale in one or two avenues of uh, the restaurants. Uh, in terms of how do I create a deal of equity, is that your question? Um, it, it's really a case-by-case -case basis, isn't it? When you find a partner, you know, a partner can come in to you with money and I could give him knowledge, for example, and that would be a different equity arrangement or different share arrangement or, or agreement. Uh, in my restaurant's case, this person was stuck with a, a property. He could not get out of the lease. I had the money. I had the intellectual property. I had the brand. I could create a brand and a business and all that. Um, so I cut him out on 30% 30, 30 for a walk-in. That, that's just coming in, setting up the bar knowledge, and being there. 30%. I gave him the money. I gave him the IP and all that, and I pay the lease. So it's, it's really a case-by-case -case thing, um, but the exchange must be value of each side. So, you know, I mean, how, how, how everyone does deals is different, I guess, so it, it must be a value exchange. For 30% for a walk-in is pretty good value. So means to say he owns 30% of the Absolutely. Place. So, um, what about the property itself? Uh, do you all own it? No, the property is leased. Oh, it's leased. Yeah, yeah. Commercial so, property in Perth is I see. pointless at this time to buy. So the equity of the business, you give him 30%, mm -hmm. you fund him, and I you own 70 Correct. Because then, of the fund. I see. So what about the profit sharing? Uh, um, 30% is his share. Oh, I see. Yep. So 30% of whatever the, 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 the money that's made is, belongs to him. Absolutely. 30% right. shareholder in the business. All right. Thank you. Hi. Um, talking about crypto and you having a knack of forecasting trends, right? Uh, uh, well, no. <laughs> no, no, no. What, what's the price going to be tomorrow? But, I mean, crypto, we're talking about blockchain technology. That's what it is. I mean, that's the back end that's driving crypto. Yeah. And with you getting into vegan and getting into food plantations, do you see the blockchain technology quickly coming into the supply chain management into that kind of area? On a personal, I think blockchain is going to take over in years to come. Mm -hmm. How so, I don't know, and I really don't know too much about the back end of blockchain. I just know it is a trend and right now, and there's a lot of currencies out there that's growing and more coming in. So uh, I'm not an expert. I just follow my intuition All right, with, with, in terms um, of investment. Following that, in your restaurants, that's uh, up, do you find that people are getting more and more concerned to know where their products come from? Yeah, it's transparent. They can ask me. I, yeah, mean, but, uh, I mean, a lot of our uh, a lot of our produce are locally sourced through uh, reputable uh, suppliers, and if they did the wrong thing, they won't be working with us. Uh, the meat, we sell meat also for their partners. It's also grass-fed, ethically grown meat. Uh, so we are uh, technically a vegan restaurant, but we are about 70 to 80% vegan. 
because uh, a lot of their partners are non-vegan. So we, we supplement uh, the need for them to sit down with their non-vegan friends as well. And uh, the vegans have uh, raved about the idea as well. So it's pretty cool because that was a big question for me. Yeah. Okay, so um, there's a whole thing about in this world if tattoo, like you having tattoos, if you're accepted or not. So since you're like in so many businesses, you must meet so many important people and people maybe that's like more up, up there and stuff. Do they ever look down on you? And do you ever feel, you know, like because you're covered with tattoos? Yeah, I think, I think people look down on people based on first appearance, but it's how you carry yourself and how you, you present yourself. So um, if I was being casual, I would just wear a T-shirt. If I was playing a different game, if I was dealing with all my high-end, high-society uh, art collectors, I wouldn't be wearing a T-shirt, you know, and uh, they won't be questioning my tattoos. They never have. I mean, you know, I have clients that are high-level PR people in, in, uh, in San Francisco, for example, that are crisis PR. That means if something happens to Exxon Mobile, uh, they, they'll be the one that pulls them out, you know, for example. So they don't, they haven't really looked down on me, N not one of them, you know, I've met David Edinburgh and all that sort of people. They're pretty casual about a lot of stuff because it's a trend right now. Back then, yes. You know, when I was growing up, it was totally uh, unaccepted. Uh, in fact, when I was growing up, when I was pre-police, uh, if we were found with a tattoo, we'd get locked up for a day in Singapore. Uh, and when I was post police, I couldn't wear the uniform because they uh, they, they made me mandatory plain plain coats uh, police officer because uh, it was still uh, a big no no with tattoos in Singapore back then. But everything's changed. So to answer your question, yes, people still look down on people with tattoos, but it's the type of tattoos you wear and how you carry yourself and present yourself. Uh, but more importantly. I think, uh, you know, they, they need to be, uh, they are open now, really. They, they're not, they weren't before, but it's, it's more accepted now. Everywhere you go, you see a tattoo. I mean, you could tell a genuine enthusiast collector of tattoos from a criminal. <laughs> right? Yeah, okay. Thank you. What gaps do you see in the vegan market in the trends that are coming with that, if any? Well, there's got to be a lot of gaps. Uh, it's just going to be big. It's going to be big because people are getting a lot of diseases now. Mm -hmm. So over time, when they realize it's too late, uh, which they are right now, right? So they're finding cures for cancer, like they just found a cure for cancer through an injection yesterday. Um, these all can be prevented. I mean, uh, you hear Chef Cynthia speak, it's all about prevention. And uh, I think if they just find the courage in looking into something alternative for their own health, they would follow it. Otherwise, they'll change it when it's too late because they'll get the bad news anyway. You Thank know? you. Thank you so much. Um, I've really enjoyed a lot of it. Thank you. It keeps my all my little gears going. <laughs> uh, I have a question. When, when you were early in the tattoo businesses and growing your business, how do you find the right, right candidates? You use that term, or the right staff. How do you, how do you bring people into the business? How do you, yeah. Because you're such an adept yourself, yeah. but then when you want to grow the business. And then the second question is, um, have you been to Locavore and what do you think? Sorry, can you repeat Locavore that? in Ubud, have you been there? No, I haven't I been haven't there. been there yet, but... No, I haven't been there, sorry. Okay. Um, finding the right people, I think... Um, for me, qualifications was never the first priority. It was the gut feeling, if I resonated with you or not. I could tell uh, them straight away when I met them, before I even looked at the resume. So, you know, and I don't believe what it always states in the paper. So if I uh, align with you, I'd give you a chance, and it wasn't your qualification. So I always thought that um, the first important thing is their appearance and their personality, how, how they show up, 
and and how they uh, you know what what their alignment is you know if, if they are kind or if they're genuine you could tell straight away within a 15 minute conversation so I'll ask the right questions then I'll go to the resume but I won't even read the resume often uh, prior to the uh, interview um, and and I'll know if it's they're for the team or not. Uh, back then, I used to make the de decisions myself. Now I make the decisions with my team uh, because the team has to agree with the person coming in. And if they don't, then we don't get them in because I want the whole team to be happy. And because my team is a long-term team, uh, they have the same alignment with me now. So if we see some, someone and we think this person has great skill, they could contribute to our whole uh, portfolio, we take them, but if they had great skill and a bad character, they don't come in because it's a waste of our time. It's a bad apple that we're going to you know, uh, invite into our team that would disrupt our, our vibe. Um, so we definitely reject. We would take someone inexperienced with a great character over a great character, I mean over a bad character with great experience. So, so finding the right person, uh, you know, we've cultured a lot of people and given them a chance when a lot of people haven't had that chance because if you're not experienced, people don't want you uh, normally. So when you give that person a good chance and he has a great character, the character is the part where you can't improve very easily because it's a character, it's a habit. Um, but the skill, we can improve. So when you give them a chance and you coach them, then they're more appreciative of that skill and they stay longer. Whereas if you get one from the other side, which is the bad character but great skill, then the whole thing is in a mess straight away and it's very hard to fix, believe me. Uh, it's tr well, because of our long reputation and our brand name and uh, what we put out there uh, and also what the, the feedback that all the guest artists have come and what they spread around because a lot of the guest artists, they are going uh, around the world tattooing in expositions and conventions and stuff. A lot of them started with nothing. Some of them couldn't even tattoo and I gave them a chance. So when they speak highly of us, a lot of people go, wow, that, that must be the shop we want to go because there's no yelling down there. They don't talk you down. They don't go out, drink massively and come back drunk. They take care of the customers. So it's all these prerequisites, these this, uh, criteria that we have to live by for our customers, but for our team members as well, and just creating the culture within it. Yeah. So it's attraction. The real answer is attraction. Hello, Mark. Hi. Um, can you just talk a, a little bit about how you spot trends, how you believe that, um, that it's a trend and not a fad? And for example, you were saying you bull bought the property in a lower down area and then it started booming. You know, it sounds like even with your art, you started something. Yeah. And how did, did you know it will be a trend or you just, were you lucky? Yeah. So I don't believe in luck. <laughs> uh, sometimes you get lucky, but often I do a lot of research as to what's lacking in the market and what people are looking at at the moment. So. In the case of art, for example, I travel all around the world. I know what the prices are for different art pieces from different continents. I know what they sell for. I know what they buy for. I know the collectors, the dealers, etc. So when I'm I'm actually going around and uh, you know fairs and stuff, I'm seeing what they sell for and how many percentages they are there. So if they're selling 70% of African and 10% of Borneo. Uh, you know, maybe 5% of uh, uh, Southeast Asian, I'll understand where the trend lies. But when you see this trend over a few years, you know that some art is underappreciated. And then you, you look at the, 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 the foresight, five, ten years down the track, you know that circulation is going to be obsolete, where they're going to buy it at a higher price and a higher price and a higher price because only what's out there is going to circulate and a lot of what's in collections are going to get destroyed or lost or sold down to someone that doesn't know anything. So then you take the percentages and basically you just find the trend of the next one, in which case Indonesian art is very underappreciated right now. So uh, a lot of the people that were holding on to a lot of stuff are slowly starting to see the value. But when African art gets to a, a, a place where people can't touch anymore, like you're talking about a million and up, then they start looking for a diversification uh, 
avenue where they can make the money. And this is where the unappreciated has the time to shine. So in terms of property as well, you look for the trends of gentrifying areas or areas of trend. For example, when uh, Korobokan, I'm talking about Bali here, when Korobokan area was very uh, populated and traffic congested and then going up to Petit Tengat and uh, Umalas was just rice fields and then suddenly you have a few shops that open and someone saw an investment opportunity, bought a land and built a hotel. The minute someone sees a trend like that, everybody starts rolling in and the prices start soaring. So it's, it's finding out a trend. For Umalas, I didn't find a trend. I just bought the property, for example, to help someone out that needed money and it scaled so much I couldn't believe. So then I started looking at the other trends here and I found that the further trend is past Changu right now. It's leading that way. But you can see these things. You can see where a lot of businesses are going just if you type in the right keywords in, in the computer and you really take the time to look at stuff. Uh, you can find trends. You can even see trends before they happen. Uh, and then it's your gut feeling as to whether you get in or not on that trend. But getting in early is the, the, the best because if you can start a trend, then you become the pioneer of that trend or the early starters, you know? So, so finding it is important, yeah. Thank you. I remember just following on from that, I remember you telling me, Mark, that when you go out to a, a place, is if you can create a track, then you know that it can be the next go-ahead area. So it's like you just got to be able to access a location and that could be the next go-ahead area, particularly in Bali. Um, just quickly to finish up, uh, how important has it been for you to have your own personal brand as Mark Pinto as opposed to Primitive for Deja Vu? How important is, is it for you? Yeah, pers personal brand is, is very important um, because it builds recognition for what you do. So I think um, selling yourself is selling your professionalism, you know, being proud of what you do as well. Um, but more importantly, uh, it's, it's important to get people aware uh, of what you stand for, you know. So, so it is important, personal brands. A lot of people fail to do their personal brands. They stick with their business brand or their product brand. Um, but yeah, personal brand completes it all, you know, and that's why you see a lot of uh, top entrepreneurs, you know, chefs or authors or whatsoever, they, they have their websites as their name, for example, because it's, it's very crucial. Mm. Yeah. I think from your perspective, what you've done, it's allowed you to attract partners because otherwise everyone would just think you did Correct. tattoos, right? Correct, so yeah. you've been able to attract partners because you've got that personal brand at that level. Yeah, so, so I've got a website that details all of what I do under my personal brand. And I've got uh, business deals from the other businesses coming over to other businesses because they see, uh, you know, partnership within my brands of my numerous businesses. And so they thought, you know, Maybe I can do that. Like I've had tattoo, uh, tattoo uh, clients go into property, for example, you know, or them going to the restaurant or wanting to do something with me as well. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's a good attraction. On that note, I want to thank you very much for being here and thank being you. so easy to interview and um, for sharing your story with everyone because uh, it's phenomenal and I just found out tonight that you were a policeman once. I didn't know that one. <laughs> uh, so let's... <laughs> I found out about that one too, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm an expert in uh, recommending toys. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> So on that note, let's give Mark a round of applause. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>